Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Start the ball rolling. Good. I hope you can all see that. Um, yeah, that's fine, Jeffrey. Yeah. As Jonathan said, I'm one of the trio of recorders for Leicester in Rutland. And uh, last year, I gave this talk to our local recorders conference. I uh, only had a 15 minute slot, so it's quite a short talk. Um, consequently, I can't go into any depth or any detail about the sort of changes. I wanted this talk really to be um, a talk where you get an idea of how uh, changes which we've seen in the work for the Atlas are reflected locally. Um, there are quite a few uh, areas in which those changes are uh, quite apparent. Um, and I'll do all those as we go along. Um, now, uh, for um, what I want to do start with is to give a, a little resume of the Atlas 2020 project, um, just to remind members of the, the aims and conclusions, and also to summarise them for new members who might not have uh, been uh, in the society for a long time and who aren't particularly uh, aware of what's been going on. So just if you indulge me for a few minutes, I'll just very quickly go over what the project was about. Now, the aim was, of course, to record the floor of Britain and Ireland over a 20 year time period in a consistent manner. So we were adopting scientific principles here and trying to make everything as consistent as we could uh, to make the conclusions as valid as possible. Uh, plotted distribution maps, as I have done in the uh, previous maps, and estimate the change in distribution and ranges of native and selective non-native species, um, and then report the findings to government. So it's a, a fairly ambitious project over this long-term time period. Uh, fact, it went on for 20 years, and a lot of people were involved, about 8,500 volunteers, and almost all of the hectares, 10 by 10 kilometre squares in Britain and Ireland, were recorded. Uh, there are 178,000 recording days, and the map on the uh, right, my screen, shows the number of recording days undertaken. Uh, this is taken from the BSBI's website. So it shows how much effort went into recording this. Uh, it really was a tremendous piece of work by what are basically a citizen science. So it's, it's absolutely a, a very good idea of a massive citizen science project. About 26 million records were recorded of just over three and a half, nearly three and a half thousand plants. The products are, of course, the website, which I'm sure you'll use. It's it's very, very good for looking at um, data if you're not quite, if you can't quite remember exactly what the changes in distribution of different species are or what their likely habitats are. It's a tremendous resource to be able to go on there and just uh, do a, a, a search for uh, the species and see what the distribution's like. And of course, there is the book, uh, which also came out and is also very useful. Um, to summarise it, the, the key trends were that uh, native plants adapted to invert our conditions and low competition showed the greatest declines. Um, some southern species expanded the range northwards and some northern species have retreated. Now, the, the northern species ranges uh, uh, may have retreated, um, not, not necessarily northwards, they may have just gone up. So they might be present in the same place as before, but just gone a bit higher. And there are some modern introductions which are becoming established in the wild, and some of which are becoming invasive. Conclusions were that, su surprisingly, that more introduced plants growing in the wild in Britain than there are natives. And the map on the uh, right again shows the number of introductions recorded in hectares in, the Brit in Britain and Ireland during the field work. Again, this is taken from the BSBI website, and you can see um, uh, particularly the effect of, of urban areas such as uh, London, Birmingham, Manchester, and Liverpool, and how dense uh, the populations of aliens are in uh, urban settings. The uh, number of natives and ancient introductions have certainly decreased by substantial amounts, and modern introductions have increased. The main driver of this change is thought to be loss of conversion of semi natural habitats by changes in land use. So that was a, a basic, very quick summary of the sort of things that they found. And having looked at all this, I wondered, well, 
can I can actually see all these changes locally? Can I see declines? Can I see arrivals and changes? So I had a look at uh, what we'd done. Uh, Steve and I produced a map of of, of the, the uh, areas in which we we covered uh, to compare that with the sort of uh, areas that the BS maps that the BSBI are producing of coverage. Um, and we couldn't, I couldn't really cover all of the habitats and the species changes in this little talk in a short presentation. So I've chosen two habitats that are or possibly were widespread in BC55. That's grasslands and marsh. And then I want to have a quick look at uh, non-natives. So this is the map that Steve produced. Um, uh, we, our aim was to get um, every hectare it's 10 by 10 kilometers square, well recorded. And by recorded means at least 75% of all species that have ever been recorded there. Um, on this map, all the green squares are where uh, we got some at least 75% coverage. Um, the yellow squares are between 70 and uh, 74%. Uh, by the time we got to, I think it was the 18th of December when we stopped recording, uh, we finally got the very, very last uh, square that we wanted to make sure that every single hectare had at least five um, well-recorded tetrads. So we did actually manage it, but right, it took us right until the end of December to actually get every single hectare with five well-recorded tetrads. And uh, I've put in, on here a particularly well recorded tetra a uh, hectare which is sk61 and this one we actually had uh, 11 tetrads and instead sort of putting them in green i've marked them in in blue so you can see the sort of coverage what we got um we we uh had quite a lot of uh, fun doing this and uh we were it was all really worth touch and go before we got to december whether we would actually achieve our objective but on one very cold day, we, we went out and got the last few records. So I was very pleased that we, we got to uh, what we decided to do. Um, so here's the two habitats. I want to quickly look at grasslands. Uh, there are a couple of species here which showed huge declines. These are Anomis spinosa, Spiny vestiro, and Cruciata lidocase, the crossword. And um, this has a more calcareous, it's often found in more precarious soils. But these two have declined substantially in the time uh, in the during this period. Uh, these are losses uh, from 1950 to 99 versus 20 to 2020, and they're done by tetrads. So you can see how much of this we've lost in these uh, periods. I know they're not the different um, lengths of time. This one's actually 49 years compared with 20. But the um, if we went on recording for this over 40 years, we wouldn't actually find any more. But it does, I think, illustrate how much we've lost. Uh, the main causes of decline, I think, for these two species are, of course, grass and loss and also poor management of uh, roadside verges, particularly where cruciata used to be found a lot in the past. Now, there's a couple here, um, Potentilla erecta and Campanula, which are found uh, mainly on more neutral soils. These two have again undergone substantial declines um, in the between these two uh, periods. Again, I think this is mainly due to uh, grass and loss, but also I think there's a, a possibility here of nitrogen enrichment because the nitrogen enrichment of soils will cause the surrounding plants to um, grow up very much taller and therefore overtop a lot of these species and perhaps uh, uh, outcompete them. Uh, a couple other species, Saxiza pretensis, Devil's Bit Scasius, and uh, Rumex acetazella, again have shown uh, quite have shown declines, not so bad as perhaps these other four. Um, but uh, they're probably declining for really different reasons. The low grasslands are of course declining. So it's always a pretentious tends to be more present in slightly wetter grassland. And these are suffering from drainage as well as ploughing up. And the Rimex is in the Zella, again, seems to prefer very much more open, shorter turf. And I think we're losing this because of the uh, lack of grazing 
and uh, the lack of, uh, uh, as well as um, destruction of habitat. There are some good news, is though. A um, couple of species, uh, Acanthus pyramidalis, pyramidal orchid, and Ophrys epiphora, the bee orchid, um, are increasing. And not just on the more calcareous areas towards the east of the county here in Rutland up through into the Lincolnshire borders. They seem to be increasing all over. Um, there's also, of course, the fact that they are rather large and colourful and orchid and people like recording them. So there may be a bit of recorder bias there. But I still think that there is a substantial increase in these species. Now, they tend to like more uh, open habitats and they, and they are appearing, um, particularly the offerings in uh, urban areas alongside road verges. As the anacanthus tends to pop up on more scrubby land or um, wasteland that's uh, it's got that's been disturbed at some point in the past. Uh, marshes. Let's have a look at the uh, losses here. The three uh, Valeriana doica marsh valerian, Ananthi fistulosa, tubular water dockwort, and Carex acuta slender tufted sledge sedge are all fairly. Uh, uncommon species, but even so, their populations are now uh, smaller than they ever were. And I think we're in danger of losing some of these species. We did find one new population of Valeriana doca a couple of years ago on a piece of private land, but when we've looked for it elsewhere, we just haven't found it. Um, I think they're disappearing because, uh, for several reasons, I think Carex acuta gets uh, outcompeted by Carex riparia on the sides of riverbanks and canals. And again, this is another effect of nitrification of uh, waterways. The Ananthi fistulosa seems to be suffering from uh, drought in early in the season, uh, plus destruction of water meadows. Also, it used to be present in uh, the size of canals, but they've, a lot of those have been canalised or treated, and I think the habitat there has disappeared. And Valeriana is suffering from um, uh, drainage of water meadows. Um, the Jacobir aquatica, the marsh ragwort used to be much, much more common. Uh, it's a plant which I very, very seldom find well when I go out. I think, again, the habitat loss of this is, is mainly due to loss of uh, good grassland, uh, wet grassland and, and drainage. A couple of other plants here, which are very are actually still fairly common. Uh, Sunny Flos Cuspidulae, a ragged robin, Circeum Palustri, the marsh uh, thistle. Uh, are still suffering, again, uh, from uh, quite severe declines. I think, I think again, this is, it shows how that the loss of water meadows and the loss of, and the drainage of land causes a loss of even, even very common plants. We'd expect it for rare plants because they're not particularly, uh, they're particularly susceptible uh, to, to any changes because populations are so low, but we're finding it now in populations where there are, um, much higher initial populations to start with. Um, I always try to be a bit positive and I try to find some plants that actually increased uh, between these two different periods and I wasn't able to. And I think it's it's really bad news for most plants. I think they're on a down trajectory. And unless we do something soon, that we're going to lose a lot of them. Um, so let's have a quick look now to some of the non-natives. Uh, Cochlearia danica, the Danish scurvy grass, you can find across, along a lot of uh, roadsides at this time of year. The leaves are just starting to appear. In the uh, last flora, which was published in 1998, book in which recording stopped in 1979, there were only four records of cochlearia, and they were all on railway ballast. Um, but now look at it, it it's uh, along here, it's all the way along the A47. Uh, this is the uh, A6 out towards Market Harbour. This is the M1. Uh, this is a huge uh, area of um, uh, distribution logistics around uh, Lutterworth. And um, up here again, these are the more industrial areas. So it's spreading substantially along these uh, routes. Uh, you'd probably buy um, roadside sorting also by, of course, the spread by the um, uh, wind that vehicles cause as they go past. In fact, some of these are really quite horrible roads to survey along because there's so much traffic on, you can get blown off the side of the road. 
Um, Paxilla distans reflex salt marsh graph similarly is following a pattern of uh, introduction along roadsides. It seems to be a little less sort of discriminatory than Paxinella, than the Cochlearia. And we do find that Paxinella, Paxinella along much smaller roads, uh, often often uh, a, B roads as well as A roads. And it doesn't seem and it does doesn't seem to be so um, confined to major trunk roads and motorways as the Cochlearia does. Uh, Alcamilla mollis is a, a garden escape, which is now the commonest Alcamilla in the county. Uh, Alcamilla filicorlis, which used to be the, which is the native species for the area, has declined substantially and it's very, very hard to find now. Um, but you can find Alcamilla mollis anywhere. Um, <clears throat> Amenthothica echoides, British Elk tongue, has actually taken over a lot of arable land and disturbed land. Um, in my Collins book of um, wild flowers from the 1950s, it records it as a rare alien confined to the south coast. But it's certainly not that now. It's it's quite a invasive. Some of the farmers consider it now to be a problematic weed in their crops. They find it very difficult to get rid of. And it's it's loves disturbed areas. And I think this is one of the indicators of how how disturbed the soils are now, how disturbed the habitats are in our area. A couple of these species have, of course, become invasive. Crushler Hamza, which we heard about in the last talk, um, it's completely surrounded Rutland water now, uh, which is quite serious because there's one or two really nice plants here, like Litterella uniflora, which are quite threatened, along with Junkers uh, compressors. Um, it's also present in other reservoirs and um, also in grassland. I found it in Leicester City, kind of growing out of a pond. And, and it had grown through into the surrounding grassland. Um, so if we get a biocontrol from that agent, I'd, I'd be very happy because I think it's one of the most serious problems we have. And some other plants which are uh, becoming invasive, I think, particularly on grassland, uh, the Russian comfrey, which has increased massively. It's probably one of the commonest flowering plants on roadsides now, along with um, Anthriscus, the cow parsley. Um, it's able to resist mowing, it, it is perennial, and it grows very, very vigorously and enjoys the nitrogen-rich um, soils that you find on the sides of roads nowadays. Right. So there's a few new arrivals. Uh, we've, we're in the middle of the country, middle of England, so we, we get things a bit later than the south. Um, the Jersey cudweed has started to appear. We've got three or four sites out that now in Leicestershire. Uh, they're all urban, and a couple of them are associated with brick paving. And I think that's probably how it's going to arrive when people have uh, brick paving drives done. Uh, and when it does grow there, it does grow very well between the paving uh, bricks, and then it escapes and establishes itself in the local neighbourhoods. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Um, Polycarp and Tetrafylum has arrived. We've got two or three of those. Again, it grows in pavement cracks. Um, Bald Machinus laticarpus, it's this new inland club rush. We've got a couple of sites for that. Um, one of them is in a, a, a golf course, but it's in ponds that were there before the golf course was there. Another one is in a country park. So we're still not absolutely 100% sure whether it is native in the county or not. It may have just been there for a very long time and nobody noticed. Uh, we do have Bob Machinus um, uh, Marina Maritima, the sea club rush, but it tends to be mainly in the north of the county along the banks of the River Saw as it enters the um, uh, Trent and also around Rutland Water. But in these two areas, we said it's a population is quite well established and they seem quite healthy. And a couple of years ago, we got our first record of Poa Infirma uh, when Paul Stanley and Brian Laney came up. We had to look at some caravan sites in the north, very north of the county. Uh, so these are some recent arrivals, which I expect we'll start to find more of um, as the years go by. But what are the drivers of change? What are the just causing all of this change? Well, it's the same really as it is in the rest of the country, intensification of agriculture, particularly the pollution by nitrates, 
and excessive use of herbicides. The conversion of grassland to arable is neglect, which is often more the case. I think uh, lack of grazing and lack of mowing is, is really quite a serious problem in some grasslands. Now, the drainage of wetland um, and the infill and neglect of ponds. There's a pond here at the bottom somewhere. It was in one time in the past, but nobody's looked at it for decades and it's filled up and it's now um, turning into land. And who knows what was there before this happened. So I think really you can see some changes. You can see some of these, these um, national changes happening locally. And we know what the drivers are. They're the same as they are in the rest of Britain. And we know um, really what to do. We do have solutions for this. And what we need to do now is really get on and implement the solutions. I think it's been really useful to have the Atlas out um, because we can now use this to um, guide policy locally. We are, in fact, uh, us and Steve and I are involved with the development of the local nature recovery strategy, and we're using a lot of the information in the Atlas to help drive um, our, the, the local county strategy for increasing biodiversity in the area. So I think the Atlas has been an absolutely tremendous help to us all, and I hope it will be uh, to other people who are in the similar position as us trying to work out these strategies to drive biodiversity uh, recovery in Britain. Okay, that's it. I hope that's just 15 minutes. I'll, I'll, and I hope, uh, hope you've in, uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, that's a, a, a very clear exposition of what's going on in, in Leicestershire. And interestingly, in many aspects, it uh, mirrors what's going on in Cambridgeshire. Um, we've certainly got plenty of um, some of the, the in more invasive aliens that you mentioned. Um, interestingly, uh, I was in Shropshire last week and was quite excited to record Helminthotheca echioides because it hasn't really arrived there very much yet, but it's clearly increasing. Um, and it, whether it will become ubiquitous or not, I, I don't know, but we'll we'll wait and see. So have people got any questions for, for Jeffrey? There's several interesting things there to think about. So um, people will, I'm sure, be, be going to do their, their, their thinking. Um, and, and there will be lessons for the future and the idea of engaging with the local nature recovery strategies i think is a, a really important one and the more we can do that uh, as botanists uh, the, the better the chance of having sensible strategies um it seems that recorders aren't always their first part of call um when the county is setting these things up um so maybe we need to be proactive on it um, so there's a question from Claire. Uh, do you know whether anything was lost with Rutland Waters flooding fields? Uh, yes and no. Um, some things were lost, and uh, particularly in the valleys, there are some populations of uh, unusual sedges which disappeared. And so there's a quite good flora in Armley Wood which was lost. Um, I remember Guy Messenger um, was very excited because he found Carex paniculata in one of the meadows and he translocated it with the help of Natural England to an area nearby called the Oakham Flooded Field. And it was established there for quite a while. And then uh, the uh, county, the Rutland County and the Highway Agency decided to uh, construct a bypass around Oakham and put that through the site where the paniculata was. So that's gone now. Um, so your answer is yes, they were when it was flooded, and then then they were later when when the, um, they'd actually been saved. The thing with that Russell and Waters, it has changed substantially. Some of the areas which there was one area which was defined in by messenger as the finest reed swamp in Rutland, but there's not a single reed there now. It's completely gone, mm. it's completely flooded out, and nothing. Um, there's a lot of Obviously, a lot of introduced planting there, and lots of species have come in with the substantial bird population. 
It does make it interesting because there is Litterella uniflora there, which is, um, uh, which wouldn't have been there, it wasn't there in the past. And uh, quite a few species have appeared since the since the uh, area has been flooded. 